Welcome to Launch Code, a premier business podcast, starring Evan Hafer, Matt Best, and Jared Taylor. Well, well, well. Welcome to the Launch Code, everyone. Hey, everybody. In the studio in San Antonio, Texas right now, you have JT and Evan on the show today. And we've got a very special guest. Uh, we have known each other now for about a year. We've uh, launched a, a, a dual initiative for veteran entrepreneurs, and I'll let him talk about it. But welcome to the show, James Skank. Thank you for joining hey, us. I appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate being here. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, before we get into what we're what we're trying to accomplish together, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Kind of give us the the five minute biography where you grew up, what university and school, kind of in time. How uh, can you give us the the once over the world? Yeah, I'll keep it really simple. I don't want to put your audience to sleep. I'm drinking my Black Rifle coffee, and I'm always energized here. <laughs> but I was born in uh, Livingston, New Jersey. I always tell everybody during my military career it was God's country, and all they would ever say is, what exit, and not really understand me. Um, (laughs) That's just what you say when you're from New Jersey, though, right? What exit is it? (laughs) I was exit 10 and very proud of it. I was 30 minutes from the beach. I was 30 minutes from the mountains, and I was 30 minutes from the airport where I can go anywhere in the world to escape. So it was a lot of fun. But I grew up in a middle-class family. Uh, I was the son of a Marine who fought in Korea. And uh, I learned the value of a job because I had uh, about seven jobs in high school. I used to cut 10 lawns every week uh, for my neighbors. I worked as an empire, empiring usually uh, three to four baseball games, little league games a week. I worked as a bank teller, uh, usually four hours a day right after school from 2.30 on. After I left as a bank teller, I went next door to a supermarket, and I worked as a cashier, usually until about 10 p.m., went home and did my homework. And then on weekends, I worked at a plastics factory. So I worked very hard. So I was so excited when I graduated high school and went to West Point, and I didn't have to work 10 jobs on on a (laughs) weekly basis. (laughs) I thought I made all the money in the world back then because I took my college savings and bought Microsoft stock at $7 a share, wow. and I oh sold God. it a year later at 14 And uh, looking back now, I would have been retired, but uh, <laughs> life goes on. <laughs> how, how was that lead up, you know, when you chose to go to West Point? Did you look at other academies? Did you look at joining the military? Was it something that you you had always wanted to do? Like, how was that lead up, and how did you make that decision? It was easy for me. Uh, my dad, as a former Marine, when my uncle returned— uh, as a warrior, Green Beret, during the Vietnam era, he built a room in my um, my home to help my uncle transition into the civilian workforce. And so I was always surrounded by folks who had served their nation in uniform. But where it really resonated with me, I was in eighth grade, and it was, uh, it's, I think of it like it was yesterday. It was 24 April 1980. And the military, uh, America's military, uh, uh, executed an uh, an operation called Eagle Claw Mm -hmm. to try to save our 52 American hostages in Iran. Yep. And the uh, rescue mission went south, and I woke up to see a service member's arm with a Rolex watch being carried around by uh, uh, Iranian citizens in triumph of our failed mission to rescue our hostages. And I went home from school that day, and I felt like our nation had a black guy, and I vowed myself that I, too, would wear the uniform of our nation. I would train hard, and someday I would be in the position to fly one of these service members home safely. And my dad, uh, being the smart enlisted Marine that he was, he said, well, study hard, go to West Point, and learn to fly helicopters, and you can be in that position someday. So I studied hard in high school. I worked a lot of jobs, got accepted to the academy, uh, studied hard, so I'd branch high enough to select uh, aviation and became an aviation officer flying uh, special operations. And this goes back to 1988, so uh, we weren't at war. And so I volunteered at the time to fly special operations along the uh, demilitarized zone in South Korea. So that was my first assignment out of flight school, uh, flying special ops. And uh, I I, I value those moments and the leadership lessons I learned working with some great Americans in that mission. What, uh, What airframe were you flying? 
uh, UA60 Blackhawk. It was amazing. Awesome. I like to say 1,760 shaft horsepower in each engine, and it can do anything and go anywhere. And I was just very proud to uh, support our, our, our defense community. Now, how long were you in the military? I served 13 years as an Army officer, and my wife, uh, I met her when I was her pilot in Korea. She was right out of Notre Dame Law School as a young uh, captain. I was a first lieutenant. She was direct commissioned, and uh, I was bragging about West Point football, and she explained to me that Notre Dame, where she had went to school, had won the national championship. And so uh, she's outranked me and been bossing me around for the last 27 years. (laughs) (laughs) But she served 25 years. I served 13, and uh, we were very proud of our service. My father served uh, in combat. My father-in-law was a Marine who served in the Korean War in combat. Most of my brother-in-laws have served in uniform. Two of my sister-in-laws have served, and my nephew now is in Syria flying in Blackhawks, has a door gunner as we speak. So I'm very proud of uh, my military family, his history on both sides of the family. That's awesome, James. So besides meeting your wife, because that's a pretty obvious one, what are some of the other experiences that you have in the military that you look back on and they were defining and memorable experiences? I've had a few. Um, The most memorable to me was the transition between West Point and Harvard Business School. Let me explain that. At West Point, as I trained to become an officer, I was surrounded by literally students from every congressional district in America. So all 50 states, uh, most congressmen have X amount of cadets appointed. Every senator has an X number of cadets at any one time at the academy. So I got to interact with men and women of all backgrounds committed to serving their nation. And when I served in the military, my most memorable experiences is working with men and women literally from all walks of life, rich and poor, tall and short, all ethnicities, united behind a common mission is to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that literally changed who I was, the pride and how I learned from all of them. And I never would put myself above or below anybody, that we're all equal in our pursuit of uh, saluting our flag and defending our nation. And then when I went to Harvard Business School, it was such an eye-opener for me because in the military, you're surrounded with folks with a common objective, folks who are willing to share credit, folks who are willing to lift each other up uh, through hardships when you're out in the field exercise or out deployed for long periods of time. And I, I, I came across, you know, my section of 88 students or 90 students at Harvard Business School, everybody was from a different country. And... Let's just say they all didn't have the same goals or ideals of democracy and freedom that I did. Right. And they all saw the world from a different lens. Not that either was right or wrong, but it really taught me about that the world is really interconnected and path dependency does matter. So somebody from Los Angeles sees the world differently at the academy than somebody that grew up in Miami or that grew up in North Dakota. And somebody that grew up in Israel or grew up in Syria or grew up in Asia sees the world differently than this kid who grew up in New Jersey. So both those experiences, my military experience and my time at uh, Harvard Business School, taught me that the world is a big place and that you really have to understand aligning interest and and, and getting people to work together from all backgrounds. So I think both lessons have been extremely formative in my leadership strategies as a CEO of PenFed Credit Union. And as I, as I try to lead others to, uh, to accomplish goals and do things to help others uh, bigger than ourselves. Now, as you spoke about leadership, uh, what are some of the most memorable command lessons and leadership uh, lessons that you, that you remember or, or kind of leaned on from your military service? I, I really three, I think, um, in, in no particular order. But in the military, everybody's contribution matters, whether it's the private the new lieutenant, the new warrant officer, or the four-star general that has 28 years of uh, distinguished service and multiple combat tours. Everybody is really part of a team of teams that needs to bring their unique expertise to the table in order to accomplish a mission or a goal bigger than their unique respective responsibilities. So it's everybody bringing their game to the table at every level to allow the organization to be successful. 
that was probably uh, instilled in me from the day I graduated West Point until today as I interact with people inside and outside the military. Everybody's contribution matters to the team effort. Second is the importance of communication and keeping everyone informed. Uh, and I'll just say, as a captain, it was so important for me to keep my lieutenants and all of my soldiers informed what, what I was thinking, what the unit was doing, what the unit was being asked to do, and simultaneously keeping my battalion commander informed and keeping those peers in the other companies, my uh, com you know my company mates, uh, Alpha Company Commander or Charlie Company Commander, when I was at Bravo Company, informed. And communication up and down the chain of command and left and right with your peers goes a long way. So many people want to hold information. And I really think Stan McChrystal said it best in his book, Team of Teams, how information needs to be shared from the operator to the analyst to third parties, whether it was the FBI or the CIA operatives, real time so everybody can bring their expertise to bear on the problem simultaneously. You can't stovepipe and try to control information. So communication is absolutely important uh, for success. And last and most important came from my days as an instructor at West Point in the social sciences department. Be kind and no surprises. Hmm. Every organization, cultures are built on trust. And when you instill in everybody that's part of that team to respect each other and respect each other's contribution, be kind to their colleagues, and never, never, never let your colleague be surprised uh, goes a long way to an organization's success. So those are the three I would think that I really remember during my uh, 13 years of service and 17 years here at uh, PenFed. So when you transitioned, uh, you transitioned out of the military, did you already know where you were going or did you have to go out and try to try to find a job and hit the road? How, how did that play out? For me, um, I knew where I was going, and it was um, very helpful having that plan. So during my time in the military, I got involved with uh, volunteering into the community. And so when I was a major at West Point teaching economics and finance, I had gotten on the West Point Federal Credit Union Board of Directors as a volunteer learning about finance and the importance of what a credit union does for the community. And the credit union movement is built on the motto of people helping people. So when I came to Washington and I was assigned to the Pentagon, I uh, got elected to the Pentagon Federal Credit Union Board of Directors as a volunteer. So even though I was right. a military officer, uh, one day a month, uh, by regulation, I was allowed to attend the board meetings and um, be part of the PenFed Board of Directors. And it was at that time I really had that passion for giving back in financial services to helping other men and women who were transitioning. So when I decided to resign my commission and go into the civilian sector, um, I had a job offer at PenFed to step off the board of directors and become part of their leadership team. And so I would encourage all service members, you, you can't wait till the month before you're going to retire to think about what you want to do as you transition. Uh, what you really want to do is be involved in activities, and it is through the network. So many of my friends, whether they, they were uh, E6s or sergeant majors or majors getting out or even general officers getting out, the ones that had the least amount of stress were the ones that had gotten involved through different community activities and shared ahead of time. I might be getting out next year or in two years and it built a network of business leaders outside the military that says, when it's your time, give me a call. You would be great to do X, Y, or Z for this respective firm. And I think it helps with the family transition, and it makes it seamless. So I always tell people, I say, what is it like leaving the military? I was like, I didn't really leave the military. I left the Army, but I inherited all the services plus the home, Department of Homeland Security as a finance uh, executive serving the national defense community. And so planning ahead goes a long way. And what what kind of challenges, I guess, you know, cultural communication, you know, going from the military into more of a corporate corporate culture, what kind of challenges did you face? Two. No one shows up on time. <laughs> and so when you when you schedule a seven thirty meeting, don't ever expect them to be there. Right. And you can't order somebody to do something. Um, <laughs> so if you become a really good listener, the best advice I ever heard as a leader at a meeting is if you do all the talking you think it was a great meeting and everybody left confused and distracted and they feel like they're not worth anything. If you let them do most of the talking, 
You ask a few questions to tee it up, but you let them do most of the talk. You do most of the listening. You think it was a terrible meeting. They left informed, energized that they're contributing and they're part of the team. Hmm. So the two lessons I learned in transitioning is you got to treat everybody with respect. Don't schedule meetings before 730 and expect a few minutes of uh, uh, roaming in time. So if it's at 930, 935, 938, people will still be roaming in, be having the coffee and having some small talk before you get started. It just doesn't run the same as it does when the general calls a, right. a 730 meeting. And uh, separately, um, always give people the opportunity at every level to have a seat at the table. And I literally learned that from uh, former Secretary of the Army, Louis Caldera. I was just a young major on his staff, and he always put me on the table with the, with the generals. And I say, but, sir, I'm just a major. I should sit off the table. And he said, no matter how smart you are, if you sit in the, sec- in the kiddie table, no one's going to think you know anything. Hmm. And so at my, at my boardroom and at my executive team meetings, everybody is equally seated around the table. No one's sitting on what we call the second or third table where they're chiming in from behind. Everybody has, whether they're a brand new employee or they're four levels down, they might be a manager and they might have some senior executive vice presidents. If they're at that meeting, everybody's sitting elbow to elbow contributing and everybody feels part of the team. Wow, that, that sounds like you could come out and give us some advice. Actually. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning something. Yeah, on this I'm learning this one too. <laughs> this is great. So, uh, have you seen a difference between leadership and management in the business world, and and from coming from the military world as well? Yeah, there there really is a difference. So, when I think of strategy, focus, and execution, leadership is laying out the strategy, and is making the decisions, the capital allocation decisions to be able to execute that strategy. So I'm fighting the battle. The decisions I make today, massing dollars where it's going to matter, building infrastructure, is it's going to allow me to win three and five years down the road. If I have to be worried as the leader about tomorrow's numbers or tomorrow's execution, I'm going to fail miserably. Management is about the daily execution. So my directors, my VPs, they're, they're executing the daily, you know, 30,000 phone calls or X amount of thousand branch visits. So understand the difference between leadership, which is setting the vision, massing resources where they matter, using economy of force where it doesn't matter, hiring and inspiring and retaining the best and the brightest. That's what leaders do. Managers are making sure every phone call is handled efficiently, that the member receives the best-in-class member experience, that they're staffed appropriately for the holiday, for Labor Day weekend. We have the right number of leaves approved. We have the right numbers of uh, 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 folks attending to be able to answer the call and man the branches. So there definitely is a difference, but there's really no difference between the leadership at the higher levels in the Army or the Air Force or any of our services and leadership in corporations. Hmm. It's important for the leaders, the generals, the— the CEO and the senior vice presidents, to make sure they lay out the strategy and communicate that strategy and hire and build the right infrastructure to be successful. And it's very important for the soldiers, or in this case, the line employees, to be able to execute the day-to-day. And that's where it comes in trust between the two, a communication between the two, treating everybody with respect, and um, really aligning the goals so we're all pulling or rowing in the same direction. Well, and that's that's awesome advice. That's that's incredible. The um, so as you transition, and, and and we're going to talk mainly about business now. When you're when you're looking at your influences throughout the last several years in business, do you have influences now, and did you have them in the past? And I have one that I talk about often, mm-hmm. and it was Ace Greenberg. He was the former chairman of Bear Stearns, mm-hmm. led it for almost three decades, uh, and he wrote a book called Memos from the Chairman. And he would write memos. This was back before emails and before we had cell phones. He would type up a memo every week to his entire firm. And if they were spending too much money on paper clips or rubber bands, or if they weren't returning a, a potential a partner's call, a vendor, it might be a cold call, he would explain to him the importance of always following up. So I took that lesson, and I communicate since April of 2014 when I became CEO. I send out an email every week to all 2,600 of my employees on different topics. Some is on professional development. Some is on personal development. 
uh, philanthropy, just different uh, exercise, physical fitness, financial fitness, different topics where I'm always um, letting them know right from the top what's on my mind, what I'm thinking. And I'm always encouraging them to lift three people up every day. So in other words, in life, if everybody just finds, I call them three warm fuzzies every day, it might be thanking a, a waiter or waitress at a restaurant. It might be thanking a coworker or a peer for something you've seen them go above and beyond. If you leverage that to 2,600 people and they really take pride and they feel self-worth in lifting others up, it's a powerful combination. So Ace Greenberg and his sort of philosophy of communication and always sharing information has really transcended how I communicate uh, to my employees on a weekly basis. And can you follow that up with some lessons learned in the last several years, just kind of the top three that you can think of? I could do five, maybe, Great. maybe three. <laughs> Great. First and foremost, <laughs> first and foremost, I'll tell to a brand new employee or somebody that's been here 27 years and is on my senior team, always keep your word. Right. If And I, I used the story I was sharing the other day. If you tell your kid you're going to pick them up at 5 o'clock at the bus stop, you be there at 5 o'clock. If you know you got a meeting and you're going to be late, you make sure they know you're going to be there at 530. Always over deliver. Manage expectations. And when you tell a business partner you're going to review their proposal and get back to them on a Tuesday, you get back to them on a Tuesday. And you, you let them know, yes or no, if, the, if you're going to fund their proposal or you're going to use their firm. Because put yourself in the partner's shoes on all the times. They're trying – if they're a salesman, they're working for XYZ Corporation – a fast no is better than a dragged out no. Always right. respect and keep your word. Second, and I really learned and I did it when I was a special assistant working for the Secretary of the Army, when in doubt, attack. When you're trying to break friction with bureaucracy, you have to move further than the naysayer. So I just watched uh, Churchill's movie, The Darkest Hour, and his war cabinet was trying to get him to negotiate and go talk to Mussolini and the Italians and you know, let's just you know negotiate a settlement. And he had to align his parliament, and he needed to move his convictions forward. And I shared it with the Washington Redskins, so the entire football team yesterday. If you're there on the line, there's any question in your mind whether to retreat or to attack, my, my rallying cry is, when in doubt, attack. You have to keep moving forward. And when you start moving forward and you show that confidence and you show that leadership, those around you will follow you. And you saw that. In America, when uh, Ronald Reagan and when George Bush and others led the effort to drive, you know, um, Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, it takes world leaders, it takes individuals who will move forward in being, when they hear the summons of the trumpet, not to retreat, but to move forward. And I think it works in life, uh, whether it's to get up and go work out or whether it's to go play a you know, game of tennis. Yeah, you can sleep in an extra 30 minutes or an hour or you can move forward. And so I guess it's always keep your word, when in doubt, attack, which is really saying keep moving forward. And then lastly and most importantly is if you surround yourself with smart people and you truly value what they bring to the table and you treat them with dignity and respect and you give them the resources to be successful and you treat everybody as equals and as part of a team and you lay out that vision of the future, they will follow you and your organization will be effective, whether it's a military platoon, a military battalion or division, or a corporation, section, division, or an entire corporate company. Uh, it takes leaders to uh, build teams and provide that team the motivation and the vision to be successful and the resources to be successful. Those are three very, very good lessons. <laughs> yeah, we need to put this out with a, an accompanying PDF from <laughs> just write it out. Some and, graphics. Here, some you can graphics download this and put it on your wall. Uh, Keep right here, and the same thing you would hear from any military officer. I think the military is an excellent training ground for veterans, uh, excellent training ground for leaders. So when veterans leave the military, they bring corporate America such a force multiplier effect, whether it's at any level, whether it's in logistics, whether it's in finance, what, you know, any company, when you bring a veteran on board can benefit. And that's why I hope we have some time today to talk about our veteran entrepreneurship initiative, because leadership trained in the military, I'm just one of 
you know, I was thinking about 80,000 new service members come in the Army every year. Right. And if you think about it, the average is a 20-year career, one twentieth of the military force is retiring every year. And you have people getting out after their first enlistment after three years or as a, as a mid-grade officer after they've been through PLDC and BNOC. And they've been deployed around the world, and they've been able to show up in harm's way, yet they keep moving forward. How do you not surround yourself with amazing veterans and allow them to take that leadership skills that the, the, the public, America, has invested so much money into and so much time training them to allow them to give back to the communities through their corporate efforts? Well, yeah, let's let's jump into it. And you kind of did. It was a good yeah. segue uh, to the Veteran, Veteran Entrepreneur Investment Program. Uh, we talked about this now for quite a while. We launched it uh, a couple, I guess now a couple months ago, and we're 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 just now at the point where you know Black Rifles really put a shoulder behind that and, and announcing it, pushing it out. We've been talking about it for several months, and you know you you touched on it, but the main focus is for veteran entrepreneurs and why 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 choose this as as your point of focus? Uh, why? I, and I guess that's the big question. I am so excited. As a CEO, one of the greatest things I can do is grow a company mm -hmm. to create jobs for hardworking Americans. The American working man and women, there's no greater honor to me than somebody that shows up, has a job, and is able to provide for their family, whether it's you know food on the table, home over their heads, sending their uh, sons or daughters to colleges. That, that excites me as a CEO. Most businesses in America is small businesses. And one out of every five service members transitioning from all the different services, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Army, you know, Marine Corps uh, officers enlisted, they want to start their own businesses. And what I've found in my experience as a CEO is the veterans I hire are strong leaders, risk takers, they're mission driven, and they strive to move the organization forward with limited resources. That's what entrepreneurship is. And what's really cool about entrepreneurs, they have amazing depth, not necessarily breadth. They are looking at solving one gap, one problem at a time. What they don't have, they see a gap or a problem based on their expertise and their knowledge. They usually don't have the capital or the network to help them get started. Right. So I say, well, wait a minute, PenFed, we have capital, our PenFed Foundation, I can raise capital. I can donate capital, invest capital, and I have a huge network. I have 1,700 business partners. I have great distribution. I have 1,700,000 members. Boy, wouldn't it be great to find young entrepreneurs getting out of the military who want to start a business? We would review their business plan. We'd bring in other partners like Black Rifle Coffee to help us select the ones we want to invest in mm -hmm. and be early-stage investors to allow this person to start a company with veterans hire more veterans, and give them a network in which they can learn and grow the marketing side, the finance side, to close the gap that they see in society and provide a better product or service into the marketplace. So we're really excited about telling the story, providing the initial funding. We're, we're, we're close to raising $2 million this year. PenFed is matched up to a million, and a million dollars coming from firms like Black Rifle Coffee, who are putting in money, and we're getting ready to announce, I want to tease a little bit, within the next month, uh, three of our first investments that are going to go to veteran entrepreneur companies that I think everybody's going to just feel very proud that these are our first three uh, veteran companies that we're investing in. We're excited about that. Now, do you have a focus uh, that you'd want to see with the, the uh, funding initiative? Do you want to focus specifically on one market or one problem? Are you come one, come all, let's, let's select the best. We're looking to select the best. We're very agnostic. Right. Uh, so one of the first company is going to be a, a product that's made in America by combat veterans. Uh, right. We're going to offer it up to our 1.7 million members and then take it to all the defense credit unions, which is 200, which is nearly 30 million potential customers right out the gate. My only challenge is, is their manufacturing capability going to be keeping up? That is and they amazing. said they can hire a lot more combat <laughs> veterans to help continue to build this product and distribute it. So we're excited about that. Another one is uh, supporting some of our first responders with a software application we think is going to be very successful. Uh, they have uh, several hundred um, first responders already signed up. It's veteran-run and owned, and we're excited about leveraging that one. 
And then we have another one which is going to be very unique around a combat uh, double amputee. Uh, we're going to build an entire company around his vision of helping uh, transitioning veterans do some really neat things, inspiring corporations. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, so we're pretty excited taking a limited amount of capital with a great network, with great distribution, providing them some mentorship and allowing them to do what they do best is lead, solve problems and constantly keep moving forward. That is awesome. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I've distilled it down to being a force multiplier. And, and for us, I think we, we couldn't have our objectives more in line with this. Uh, and you know, you, I think, and, and, I, and let me just jump in. I mean, I, and I'm not giving a plug for Black Rifle Coffee, but the reason I am so excited about what Black Rifle Coffee stands for is here is a, an individual that went in a harm's way on behalf of their nation, uh, came back home, had a vision, uh, raised, you know, take some money from their checking account, start a business. So now is employing, you know, nearly 100 you know, veterans, and it's going to continue to grow, serving a product that everybody needs. I travel around the country now. I was in Puerto Rico with Gary Sinise a few months ago, and the commander says, you want a cup of coffee? And he brings me out Black Rifle Coffee. And it just, <laughs> it's such a great feeling uh, to be able to get my order every month and knowing the money is going back to a company that hires veterans, believes in the national defense community, stands up when the national anthem is played, and uh, I'm very proud of what you all stand for as, as a firm. And we want to invest in other veteran entrepreneurs across business lines. It doesn't have to be a, a product. It could be an IT service. It could be a force multiplier that's a, a meeting a specific need. Our only requirement is it is founded and wholly owned out the gate by the, um, by the veteran. Well, and I'll tell everybody out there that there really doesn't, they don't get better than, than, than James. They really don't. We, we sat down uh, several months ago, and he walks faster than I do. He talks faster than I do. He thinks faster than I do. Uh, he's extremely uh, motivational, and that's putting it lightly. You could probably double as a motivational speaker as a side job. Uh, very interesting and very invested in the community uh, we're, we're, we can't be more humbled and absolutely excited to work with you guys on this, on this initiative. Uh, you know, I want to kind of sew it up here with one last question, which is this one piece of advice you would give uh, transitioning service members for preparing for, for civilian life. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. I'll keep it really simple. So many people have a lot of pride and they want to let everybody around them think they have it all figured out. I have no issue when somebody calls me up, a former student from West Point, a former uh, sergeant that I served with in Korea, a former captain or even actually a former uh, boss, and says, James, I'm looking to transition. I'm trying to get into XYZ Corporation. Do you know anybody there or what advice would you give me? Don't be afraid to let folks know once you make the decision to get out, I'm not saying if you're if you're a company commander or you're a battalion commander, you're thinking of getting out to let your, your chain of command know, hey, I'm looking to get out in six months. I really don't want that next promotion. That's not what I'm saying is once you let your peers know you're getting out, make sure you tell them, hey, I'm looking. It's hard. I mean, for our internships, PenFed had 35 interns this summer. We had 3,300 applications. Wow. Sometimes it takes that little phone call, and it doesn't get that person a job, but sometimes I can call over to another bank, another financial institution, a, a defense firm that I know, and say, take a look at this individual. I know him. I can vouch. He's ethical. He's a hard worker. But unless they ask for help that make that call, they're going against tens of thousands of other resumes. And it's okay to tell those around you, hey, can you call on my behalf? Can you put in a good word for me? Because... You need a big funnel to get those two or three offers so you have choices, so you're not forced to take something that's not the right choice for you and your family. Well, this, is, this has been a great conversation, James, and I appreciate it. The one, I guess, the, 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 the last thing, and I promise it's probably the last thing, which is uh, if, if people are looking to utilize PenFed for any type of uh, financial result, what, what things do you guys specialize in, and, and what can they utilize PenFed for? 
Okay, we're known uh, as the price leader, so we have the best uh, certificates. So if you want a safety account with certificates of deposit, our one-year certificate, three- and five-year certificate pay the best interest in the nation. Uh, so if you need an emergency fund and you're looking to save, we have a high-yield savings account, we have a world-class checking account, we have world-class certificate pricing. On the loan side, we are a market national leader in mortgages, in car loans, and in credit cards. Our credit cards that pay 2% cash back to our, uh, our power card to the military community. Think about it. everything you buy for the rest of your life, you're only paying 98 cents on the dollar. That really adds up. There's no tiers and there's no limit. So we like to say cars, cards, castles, and certificates. If you need one of those four things, we're going to take perfect, perfect, perfect care of you. And if you're a veteran that's transitioning and you're looking for startup capital, let us know your business ideas because we're looking to fund uh, veteran entrepreneurs to help them get started. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll get you on here again, hopefully soon, because we need an update on how the, uh, the, the funding initiative is moving forward, who we've actually selected. We'll keep everybody posted on what's going on. Uh, super excited to announce this initiative. I can't thank you enough, James. Uh, thank you for your time, and we'll look forward to getting you back on. Thank you, James. Very inspiring. Hey, we appreciate the partnership. And again, I'm just one data point. Thanks for letting me share our views here at PenFed. 2,700 folks strong, love giving back to the national defense community, the men and women who fight and win our nation's wars. I can't say thank you enough to all of them and to all Americans who support them. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was James Skank. I'm Jared Taylor and Evan Hafer. This is Launch Code.